for Etherpad note takers. <clears throat> Anybody need to uh, this first thing we have to do? So let's I know um we have someone driving, so uh, Russ Housley can't do it. Somebody else who's not driving who hasn't done it. Did you put a website together, Ned? Uh, I did. Uh, there's a link on the agenda. The Etherpad. I might start calling out names. Hi, yeah, this is Rich. I'll take notes in the Etherpad. How's that? That's great. Thanks, Rich. That would be awesome. <clears throat> uh, one, one more to help out. How about Guy or Lawrence? Lawrence is going to talk, be talking. L Lawrence will be talking. <clears throat> I, I will. I will help Rich after I talk. That's Michael. Okay, I can yep. I can help. Out Thank you. Michael's talking. Ned. Okay. So we have no takers. So uh, <clears throat> our agenda today is mostly uh, uh, Lawrence, but we do have five minutes for architectural uh, update and status, as well as uh, I think we're gonna have a few minutes on use cases. Uh, quick. <laughs> Sorry, quick interrupt. Which uh, link for the Etherpad? Etherpad um, slash p slash uh, notes dash itf dash rats dash vi dash twenty twenty dash o two dash o five. It's on the agenda. I don't know if you can see the screen. I'm trying. I think I'm displaying. Oh it. yeah. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, any any other agenda items we need to cover today? Well, we have a full agenda, so. <clears throat> All right, so uh, Michael, uh, how about you take uh, start off with uh, update? Hey, did I take the ball for displaying there? Yeah, he took the ball. Okay. I'm using I Rich. Okay. Ned, can, uh, can you put the Etherpad link in the chat room, please? Sure. I did that actually already. Um, oh, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, briefly <clears throat> about the design team. Uh, we posted a new document yesterday. Um, the diffs should be quite useful. Um, who has it been? Um, and I, I feel I missed one or two people on this list. Dave Taylor. Uh, Frank, William, Hank, Thomas, Monty, Ned, Eric, and I'm sure I missed one person here. Yourself. Myself. That's <laughs> true. Myself is in this list, and I think there's somebody else that I've, I've missed that's probably really loud, and I forgot about them because they're so loud. Um, so we've been meeting Tuesdays at 10 a.m. EST. Um, so yesterday we had a meeting. We had about eight meetings uh, since ITF 106. Um, Eight open issues still, two closed. We had 21, uh, 23 poll requests, two are still open. So most of the meeting has been spent um, going through the suggested text someone has proposed and uh, a lot of heavy bashing and a lot of going around, I wouldn't say in useless circles, but sometimes it seems like circles uh, about a precise uh, meanings of word. And I think that that's a little bit what we're really, that's what our, our goal is to nail things down. I feel that we're making a lot of progress um, and we have, I think, a fairly good consensus process going forward. Um, so there's the URL. Um, I could paste it into the chat even um, that has the diff. Um, major things since version uh, 00, which was a very skeleton is we've added a composite tester concept. So this is the idea that you have either a chassis with a bunch of line cards you want to attest to, or in some cases you may have um, an Android or other mobile device that has some additional processors or even uh, enclaves or something like this that will attest around for each other. Um, we filled in a lot of the conceptual messages, um, passport 
background check model, this kind of thing. Um, and we added a bunch of diagrams. Um, we're currently discussing third slide still to do. We still have a fair bit of discussion of the terminology. There may be some additional additions that we make, but we're trying to keep it fairly fairly tight. Um, we have an introduction that we need to write, um, and probably would have take text from one of the other drafts that was proposed. Um, the working group still needs to decide if they want any use cases in this document. And if so, uh, do you want some of them, all of them, how many, at what level of detail? So we haven't had any good news case documents. We have some text coming, uh, which is uh, on the, essentially it's been called the layered approach to attestation, and this should be recognizable to many who are familiar with Secure Boot and uh, Trusted Boot, um, and how that, that kind of process uh, works. And so that text will probably slide in the next week or two. Um, Based upon the rate that we're going, I expect us to have a document that could be working group last called uh, by IETF uh, or perhaps just finishing one or two things at IETF. Um, and that's about it. I, I guess I should I'll stop here for questions about what's going on. I think this Michael, is really this is good Russ progress. Housley. Mike, this is Russ Housley. One of the things that um, I talk in hallway conversations I hear people saying is, you know, we keep talking about how suit, cheap, and rats all tie together. Is one of the use cases going to explain that? Uh, yeah, so we already have, in the use case document, we already have that as a use case. Um, we also have the the, the fact that uh, that uh, that the cheap use case is in fact a hybrid of background and uh, passport check um, mechanism or topologies. So that's actually one of the driving factors for some of the, the documents there. Um, as to how does to uh, uh, precisely connect into it. Um, I don't think that we have anything specific to say at this point, uh, but I guess if there was, and I'm not sure that there is a direct connection. I think it's a connection through Keep um, as a use case for Keep, that students as a root use case for Keep, and that Keep is a use case for RAT. Um, so I don't think we have a direct connection to just to students, unless I don't understand things. We had some conversation. We had a bunch of conversation about the suit manifest structure and how it might may or may not relate to the 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 thing we're calling endorsement. Um, so this is Dave. I was just going to uh, agree with uh, Michael that I that chances are the relationship to suit will just be in a TEEP architecture document that may not appear directly in the RATS architecture document. Maybe it's, it's, uh, as simple as saying, sorry, maybe it's as simple as saying that uh, the We can't hear you. Yeah, you're breaking up. Sorry, I'll try Back again. Maybe it's as simple. Now I'm here. Hello? Go ahead, Russ. Yep, go. All right. Maybe it, maybe it's as simple as saying that the software needs to come from an authenticated source. But the RATS architecture document doesn't talk about sending software. The TEEP architecture document does. The the use no, case I understand that. in in RATS because I think you're commenting on uh, you know the Michael's presentation which you may not be able to see right now but he said you know the working group needs to decide if they want use cases in the architecture document if so all of them how many what level of detail. I think you're answering uh, that you certainly want the TEEP use case covered in there and you're asking about the relationship to suit and should that be in the level of detail that's in the uh, RATS architecture document. It's just I hear um, a lot of people talking about how the three fit together and so it's important that the architecture at least provide a hint. Uh, certainly the deep architecture place. does. I think the question here is whether the RATS architecture document needs to go into the details of the deep architecture, deep 
use case or to leave that to the T uh, architecture document? I think that's the question. So, and I think one thing needs to be clear if it's specified because on the list, some were inferring that we could just use the suit manifest, but there are other manifests that are widely adopted for software update for larger systems. Like I, I can't see Dell adopting the suit manifest because we already have stuff we use that's well adopted elsewhere. Right, so, but we, we may so want to say, do sorry. other things. Exactly. So, but but you want to, but what to do is either have a trustworthy source of right? those packages, or you can do remediation with them. And remediation is one of the goals Red is working towards too, but is not having its scope. So the remediation action could be this sentence that we have somewhere in the reduction, maybe or somewhere else near there, um, that says and, and suit has some remediation capabilities due to updating complete bundles of software. The end. Um. So what I'm just saying is that is one option for a format yeah, for manifest, but there are other viable options that are well adopted that mm -hmm. may be used as well. So, we may have I a bow tie diagram. Okay, I have to go back to the diagram. Go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, I was going to say, I think what Russ is suggesting is from an architecture, just make mention how the three interplay as a potential use case, not necessarily that that becomes the mandatory, right? And Kathleen, that should exactly. serve yes. your purpose. Exactly yes. right. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and I, I understood that from Russ as well. I just wanted to clarify the other point so that people um, saw a bigger picture that's outside of the <laughs> IP. Okay. Um, okay. Going, going. Yeah, wait. Sorry, it's on mute. This... Was there a comment? Yes. Sorry, this is Rich. Um, Mike, is, Mike said, oh, we'll be done, and then we can go to working group last call, and I think that's inappropriate to go right from a design team that's been working for weeks directly to last call. It should sit in the working group for some number of weeks. That is I, correct. I, so, I, I, I agree with you. We're trying to come back to the working group regularly so that nothing is a surprise. Good. Um, but um, I guess we've also been told to uh, get it done. So, um, you know, uh, if the working group chairs want to have a six-week last call or whatever they want to do, it's, it's whatever, whatever is appropriate is up to you. Shout louder, I guess. Okay, so so the question, Michael, is when does the team believe they can have a draft ready? You said around the time of IETF 107, but it would be good if you had something at least a week or two, preferably two or more, which is about now, um, to give the reviewers or the participants a chance to review so that we could have the question at the IETF 107, whether the group well, the, believes the, this. The, I believe that I believe the, the draft cutoff date is March 9th. Um, yeah. And um, so that's in four weeks, about. Um, and we have a hackathon in two weeks. I imagine that uh, for those of us who are there, and um, we will make some significant in-person progress on any outstanding issues that we have. Um, so I, what I see is that the draft will be, call it feature complete, um, in about a week. Um, and then that leaves us about two weeks for, for debugging if you want to take my software uh, model. Um, at this point, it's not feature complete. We have some questions about whether we should have certain features or not. And so we're very much looking for the working group uh, feedback on that. Um, and I guess we'll make a decision if we don't have, we don't clearly hear, we don't clearly hear an answer. And, and I have, I, I will actually post some emails to start some discussions on some of these questions, but don't feel you have to wait for me. Okay, we're kind of into Lawrence's time. I'm done. Okay. Any any other comments? Uh, if not, we're going to switch over to Lawrence. 
Yeah, I'd say just post the um, the document, Michael, and then we'll move from there. Don't worry about the procedures yet. <clears throat> All right, I've made an attempt to start sharing. Can you hear and see? Yes. Okay. All right, I'll let me jump right into it here. Okay, so um, there's been uh, one of the open issues here was, well, let me, oh, sorry, back up a minute. So my hope here is to get a permission uh, to merge uh, a bunch of pull requests that are outstanding and produce a next draft of the, the RAS document. Um, I, I don't, I'm hoping that, that the pull requests, I don't think they have to be perfect at this point, um, but I think we need to get some of this into a, uh, because we're, we're not anywhere close to last call, uh, but I think it would be really beneficial to get some of these into a, a draft for, published draft for people to look at. So that's my goal here. Um, uh, you know, we don't have to close the issues. We can just uh, you know, want to make sure I'm, I'm up, for, uh, up front with the process here. So, um, okay. So on UID uh, size discussion, um, I think it was Montreal when uh, uh, someone pointed out I wasn't paying paying attention to the birthday problem. So uh, now I am, and um, have uh, um, done some math and. Um, some uh, thinking about how big UEIDs should be. Um, this is for the UEID that is based on a random number, not the UEID that's based on like a, an IMEI or a, um, uh, any of these other schemes. So um, first I wanna point out that U UEID sizing is not the same as for IP addresses um, because they can never be reassigned or reused over time and space. The devices might not be IP connected, um, and you know we expect there to be very large data databases of IoT devices in in, in IoT backends. Um, so I considered uh, three use cases um, uh, or three or three scenarios. One where you know we have 10 billion people, each device, each person has 100 devices, and that's because this might be light bulbs and motors and parts of cars and parts of refrigerators, parts of public infrastructure like traffic lights and parts of uh, the factory that they work at or the office they work at and, and so on. So 100 actually is maybe small in that in that way. Um, 100 over their lifespan? Uh, or concurrently? I didn't think about that. Um, if it can't be reassigned or reused, <clears throat> that would be lifespan. Yeah. It seems small. Yeah. So, um, anyways, but we get a database size there of a trillion. That's a, that's. There's also an assumption based on that the, the database would only be um, one tenth of the devices, the largest database. So um, that scenario seems highly realistic, and we're fully expecting it to happen. 128 bits is enough for that. Um, the next scenario, okay, we bump that to 100,000 devices per person. Um, now we've got a database of uh, one quadrillion device, uh, one quadrillion, um, and then 120, 120 bits is seems marginal for that. Um, uh, this is kind of the edge of what I think we could, you know, from what we can imagine today. Um, and then the third case where um, we've upped it to 100 billion people, and maybe because maybe we're I don't know tagging um, all mammals or something and a million devices per person. Now that, that seems all you know speculative. Maybe we're dealing with nanobots or something like that. Anyways, that, that's a, just to, to, to test the bounds there, so another use case there. Um, so that would need 192 bits at least. Is that including the birthday paradox or not? Yes, yes. So there's an uh, appendix. Uh, I'll show you, the, show you that calculation in a minute, but um, I think our options are we can just we can say it's 128 bits, which is kind of what like uh, GUIDs do, do. Um, and we never expand to that beyond that. We can say it's 128 bits now, but you should uh, anybody that's receiving you, uh, you should allow for 256 bits, or we can just go straight to 256 bits. So the center of gravity seems to be on our option two. Um, 
So let me show you some of the background for the calculation here. Uh, let's see. Um, so the, the first table there is how I got the number of uh, entries in the database. So a little more detail there. So 10 billion people, 100 devices per person. Each device has 10 subsystems. The largest database is only 10% of, of the entire population. So these two columns here, uh, the, the subsystems and proportion basically cancel out. So then I did the probability calculation based on the birthday attack um, for, for you know, one database of those. So two times 10 to the minus 15 for 128 bits and a trillion records, that seems uh, okay. 10 to the minus nine for a quadrillion seems marginal and, and one in 10,000, I think, or one in 50,000 for 10 quadrillion is clearly a problem. Uh, 192 bits is good for all of them. Then I assumed that the, the database, 10% of the database changes per year to try and calculate the time between a collision. Um, that's a very pessimistic uh, view. Um, uh, so, you know, the, these numbers are, are very pessimistic. Um, so, um, you know, you might say, well, okay, you calculated it at eight seconds, but that's a really a worst case. So it's maybe more like 10 days or something like that. Um, but anyway, this, that was where, you know, I was really trying to get to pin this down to a number for this active database. I don't understand the database reference. Is, are you saying that the, someone has to maintain a database and check for collisions or that they're probabilistically not going to collide? I'm saying the, the, the situation where, where collisions are going to occur are in some database somebody is maintaining. Um, I'm assuming that somebody will be maintaining a database, one of these IoT service providers. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily and, for every device you're saying, but for all my devices or for all whatever. So for, I, for 10, eight, for eight, ten eight. yeah, for yeah. ten percent of known devices, the largest database will cover ten percent of the all the devices out there. So I want to ask about the birthday problem and the database, and I don't know if this is arguing that number one is an option more than you thought it was or what, but the question is, um, you're assuming that a collision happens whenever the ID is the same. What I'm going to ask is, is that really the collision or is the collision only if the ID is the same and it is signed by the same entity? The GUIDs are supposed to be, in the, or the, the, the UUIDs are, are supposed to be entirely independent of any other parameter such that you can rely on them solely for uniqueness. I'm asking, why is that the case? Because it's the simplest and cleanest design. Um, I'm going to question that because I would say, let's say that you have a design that can easily use GUID. So you're stuck in the 128 bits, right? And so the way that you deal with the collisions is you say, I'm going to only consider it to be an exact match if the uh, GUID matches and the signer key matches. What I'm wondering is, does that mean that 128 bits is more than sufficient for now and forever? That's my question. Or well, do I need to use the, the, this ID in my local database to figure out who the valid signers are? Um, I, I, I had not considered that option. My, I'm, I'm just asking. I don't, I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but I'm throwing it out there for people to think about. Like I can tell Michael's thinking about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My thought was that that is that the UEIDs should be as independent as possible. And um, All right, so the, you're, you gave an analogy to IP addresses before, just to explain how they're different, right? And so in the IP addresses, you can have IP addresses that collide as long as they're in a different context, like link local addresses and so on. And so if you use that analogy that says, do you care if the IDs collide if they're in a different context? Maybe the context is the signer key. That's just what I, what you made me think about. Right. The, <clears throat> the question is around, is, is there a use case for an anonymous, unauthenticated uh, UEIDs? And if there is, then you can't assume that there's a key signing them. Uh, 
yeah, it just seems we get into messy dependency now that we have to think about how uh, how uniqueness has to be based on something else or some other system. And well, no, another way to think of it is the EUID has got a local part and a signed part, and the you know the the global EUID, if you will, is the combination of the local part and say a hash of the EUID. And for anonymous, you just make the hash value be zero. Well, that's a great point. Uh, if we think about it that way, then you'd say your full global UID, just to use your term, is maybe it's, I don't know, 256 bits or something like that, of which 128 bits is a GUID, and the other 128 bits or whatever is a hash of the signing key. Exactly. Very interesting way to think about it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the... Uh, there is no specification how the uh, UEIDs are you know, created, and it's entirely, uh, you know, they should have the, 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 the appropriate amount of entropy in them. Uh, but, I mean, you could uh, be compliant probably with the EUID spec by doing that, just taking the, the, the hash of the signing key and a GUID and hashing those together to produce 128 bits. That's probably... Uh, compliant with what uh, is, is being asked of EUIDs. So the reason that I'm thinking that I kind of like that suggestion is because I, I expect you're going to put an ID into an actual claim. And so even for constrained devices, these numbers are going to appear in the claim sets. And if you say you only have to encode 128 bits, your claim sets get much smaller, right? And so you can deal with uh, constrained devices much better in, say, option one than in option three, right? And so if you do it the way that we were just talking about, then you only did 128 bits in there because your signing key is already in there elsewhere. Exactly. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't like that idea. Um, well, uh, for constrained devices, I think it's better than option two. 32, you can't afford 32 bytes. If you could, you wouldn't be arguing that, gosh, I need Seabor. Yeah, for um, other IOC, questions, are they repeated? Easy. Are they repeated <laughs> in different claims? Uh, if you look up at the top of the slide, it says subsystems per device. And so that means even within your own device, the average is here is you'd be repeating it 10 times. Yeah, the different that's, what I thought. that's what I thought. Yeah. All right. That doesn't mean they have the same signing key. But the signing key is already around. Is already got to be trans. Is already got to be indicated somehow. So, so those are ten, those are ten independent eats uh, that may have oh. no that should have no relationship to each other. That's that that's not a reduction possibility. I I, I I don't agree with that because those may be subsystems in the comp in the composite evidence or subsystems in the layered one where they do have a relationship between them. So ten layers of some sort, or a tree of things of you know three layers with. Uh, various leaves and so it's not just a chain it's a tree so there can absolutely be a relationship between them but you're right there can be keys that are different but michael's right that you already gotta put the keys in that uh in the evidence anyway in different claim sets but the, yeah the explanation for, for anonymous was that there's an assumption of reserving 128 bits for the empty key that has to be represented somehow that mm -hmm. ends up in you, you sort of end up in the 256 bit space yeah. somehow anyway. Well, it's encoded in C so we actually have a link that we can have an empty string with an empty key. Like we could say there's a thing and it's just not here. So, based on the interesting dis the suggestions given so far, I'm going to argue for option one. Yeah, with, 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 with respect to the, uh, the variation of option one, where yeah. option, where option one is how many bits are actually encoded in the claim set, even though you, what you're using for matching is say 256. You're you're arguing for uh, UID, a UEID that's defined in a very different way. Correct. Yes. And so yeah, um, I think we're probably going to have to take this to the list for some back and forth discussion because. Uh, the the clear intent of a UEID here was it is the sole thing you need to uniquely identify the device in the world, and if you want the, that that identification to be based on uh, more than one claim, some combination of claims or characteristics or pieces of the eat, then I've got to go back to the drawing board on this. So, eh, I think it's actually more like 
uh, I don't have the slide, option three, where it's 128 or 256, um, because if you have the context, then you can use, quote unquote, the short form. Right, but we have, to, we, have, we have to specify just, how the context works, right? Um, yeah, but it may just be as simple as if you have the key available, then you can, and you and you're concerned, you can use the long, you can construct the long form, which is the digest of the public key that signed the the entity that contains the EUID. <clears throat> There's some intuition in, in the use case, which is devices per person. Person is the is the key holder, and devices is the is are the uh, UEIDs that are owned by that person. It's sort of already broken up into two numbers. It's just to give a size of the database. It serves no other purpose. I understand. It's just, but it's in, it's some intuition. I mean, if you go if you go for two fifty six, then you're basically saying there's still there's still the the owner, the person, and their key, which is going to disambiguate from some other owner. Uh, so, yeah, I do think it's so you, there's a fork here. You guys are uh, in the the intent, the, the very clear intent of UEID is it is the sole claim that identifies the device uniquely. And what I what I'm hearing everybody say is no, we don't want that. We want the uniqueness of the device to be identified by a combination of claims, and some sort of a GUID thing that, uh, that's not a UEID is one of them. I think that's trying I'm to that for uniqueness. tiny constrained for constrained IoT devices, a uh, smaller number of bits is better, uh, especially uh, if the um, problem is purely speculative. Then it so like I'm looking at your screen right now. Scenario likelihood speculative, right? Um, putting um, a definitive cost in the short term on tiny devices. Or things that are purely speculative may not be a good trade-off. That's what I'm pushing back on. So I was I was in the option three camp before because I thought 256 was affordable and um, uh, simple enough. Um, listening to Dave's argument, I'm now in option two, and I want to point out that in a CBOR structure, at least, relatively easy to to. 128 bits or 256 or some prime number in between if you prefer um, and that it's the complexity in dealing with this is really on the receiver which generally not not as constrained so um, option two that 128 is the minimum but that we should allow for more seems like a probably reasonable to me. Um, so Michael can you uh, elaborate on your probably so uh, if you have a constrained device that is a, um, I guess I'm going to phrase it as a relying party. So let's say you have a uh, light bulb that you want to turn on or turn off, or, or perhaps a better example would be I have a door lock, and I only want to allow it to be locked or unlocked by something that's attested. Well, and so the question, because I thought Lawrence originally said that you need to put in on the receiver side now things that might happen way off in the future. And so what would you do in your uh, door lock or other constrained device? Uh, well, I'm not sure that I accept your, your use case um, okay. to begin with, um, because enough. I'm not sure that, that I'm going to do an attestation every time I turn the light on and off or unlock or lock the door. I think it's going to happen at some commissioning time. And so I think there's something more complicated going on there. Um, no, no, sorry. Let, let me rephrase my use case. I, I only want to allow it to be unlocked by a remote party who's been attested. Now, the other way around that is to say, well, the remote party has to go through some verifier, and as long as, it's, as long as it comes in signed by the verifier's key, I never pay attention to the UI, UEID of any sender. Right? It's not even in the attestation result. I, I, I would tend to think that that's actually what's going to happen. Um, but that, and that's that, the passport model that I'm describing. Yeah, fair enough. Go on. Okay. So if you want to do it the other way around, then... Um, then, you know, except that there may be a cost in the future. But that's why I'm saying I think we can live with 128, but I'm pessimistic about 
about this and so I'm saying like, well, okay, so if we live with 128, that means we don't pay any network costs for the extra uh, extra bytes now, but we potentially pay for a code space uh, 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 requirement to be able to process it in the future, right? So that's where it comes down to, I think, right? I think that's a good point. Okay, and 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 my observation is that code space crunches are we're mostly over. We're at the you know you can have a couple megabytes of code in most fairly tiny devices now. It's not 64K anymore, um, and so I don't think that is going to be such a big deal um, um, for for that. Bootloaders and other stuff that suits dealt with. You know what? There, there's other code space constraints, but I don't know that that matters here. So, um, my understanding of I'd, I'd like to make an I'd like to make an observation that I think the two the two sides of this are talking past each other in one respect. Um, one of you is talking about a unique a thing to uniquely identify the device, and another seems to be talking about uniquely identifying the claim or the attestation. So no. if ownership no, no. of the device Neither. changes, if ownership of the device changes, do you expect a different identifier? No. Well, I mean, what do you mean Good. by ownership? Okay. <laughs> I'm, uh, w second, why do you say no? Because there are privacy issues if you say no. It's all over this thing. I, I, I'm going to say yes for exactly the same reason as people argue that you should change the MAC address of a device when it changes ownership. There are arguments about that as privacy. Yeah, I, I, I think it will change. I think it will. I think it will become the draft really very thoroughly. I think ownership transfer. I think ownership transfer is an important point that needs to be covered in the discussion, and uh, I think there are valid arguments as to why things should change. And I, but, but the main point is this needs to be discussed. Great point, Russ. Okay, so I think we need to regroup on this. Um, I'm basically going to plan a, a much more very uh, detailed step-by-step -step review of what's in the draft for the next interim to try and get to the bottom of this. I probably will write an alternative version of the pull request that is where you save 16 bytes by combining the, uh, the, the, some sort of a, an ID, which I will not call a UE ID with a, a signature a key identifier and try and deal with the complexity of that. Um. I'm still thinking about Michael's suggestion. I found Michael's suggestion uh, a great way to think about it. And so, so far, I can't find any faults in Michael's argument. So, thank you. That would be useful to discuss as well. So, let me understand. I, one thing I did not understand when it wasn't clear to me one way or the other um, from various people's points was um, whether this set of bits is standalone as the identifier or it is in combination with other claims. Was Michael's suggestion standalone or in combination with other claims? Standalone. 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 What he was suggesting was that when you generate UIDs in the short term, meaning for now, for the next couple of years, the high 128 bits is always zero. So when you encode it in CBOR, it gets to be compact as much as a 128 bit number would be. You don't spread it out across the full 56 bits. So, byte string. So I got that right, Michael. Right? But for right now, you generate 120 bit. I, I, I didn't. I didn't know I exactly bit. said that, but I guess that's what option two is. Yeah, you do 128 bits now, yeah, and yeah. Um, and yeah, effectively the upper bits are zero. Um, I hadn't thought whether they're the upper or the lower bits, but you know, yes, okay, upper bits are zeros, and so yes, it's a byte stream. How else would it be encoded in CBOR? I have no idea. Um, other than as a byte string, so uh, but but is it, I guess it could be encoded as an integer. But um, do we support 256-bit integers? Same same. Oh. It's a it's a very big integer. Unsigned. It's the same same size. Yeah, it's the same thing. Doesn't matter, right? So so that's I just that's how I would think it is. And so look, you know, as I said, if we want to have 192, 
I think we shouldn't because that's a code space issue for dealing with the, on the receiver. We should have mm -hmm. 128 or 256, and that's it. And anything else is an error. Um, and 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 that's enough, that's good enough to test with. Like right? you can test those two cases, and if you need to do that. Yeah. So, so if, you, if you if you use a if you use a GUID generator now and you fill it into a 256 bit field and C4 compresses it into a 128 bits, then that's just as good in as the at the bandwidth level, not the code space level, but the bandwidth level is the same as option one. <clears throat> if a if a UEID is something that a hardware manufacturer has to burn into fuses or something, then that adds cost if if you don't accommodate smaller values. And if they're if you're but we're, zeros, we're, that's a that's a lot of waste of uh, fuses. You don't have to put the zeros in, right? So if if you're going to burn 128 and you've made the decision to 128, then I think you're just fine. Um, and the the you know, I, I going forward, we may have a point that says, you know what, we're we're switching to 256s, and and you know, there'll be a mix for a couple decades, and whatever fuses become very cheap or something. I don't know. Um, maybe we'll never need them. So, I think Michael, you're just saying you want option two, which is what the current text says, and that's what I did say. I did say I want option yeah, two. I'm so convinced for option two. Yeah, um, so the current text is fine. Maybe we want to disallow values between 128 and 256 bits, so it's either one or the other. That's fine with me. Um, I don't know either way, but. Um, well, there's, there's going to be cost associated with, with whatever you pick. So if you're forcing 128 or 256, then if the use case only requires 192, then you're you're sort of adding unnecessary cost. <clears throat> um, this is Hank. If you want to have uh, incremental steps between 128 bits and uh, 32 bytes, and then heading to it, just make it byte intervals, not single bits. That would be like um, difficult, I assume. Just make it at eight bytes, eight bits, eight bits steps, and then it's okay. Uh, yeah. Really, there's no big deal to it, I think. I mean, I would expect the implementer to burn a 128-bit secret into the device, use a uh, KDF to d derive multiple keys and IDs from that. That's the smart way to do that. So you it, it shouldn't increase the number of bits. Yes. This is pr probably smart implementers will not need to add any more fuses to implement uh, UEID like this. Are you saying to get to 256, you only need to start with 128? Oh, no, 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 okay. no, I'd, I'd be uh, <clears throat> I was going to say that doesn't make sense. If I could do that. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so um, sounds like it's okay to merge. Are we okay to that, to merge that? All right, doesn't mean it's stuck that way forever, but I'm, I'm going to take that as an okay to merge and move on here. Okay, so um, on to submods. Um, this is a, a, a repeat slide from uh, Singapore, uh, nothing new here. The um, uh, reason I'm, I'm hitting uh, submods again is I want to make sure there's enough understanding of what's in the, the current uh, pull request and kind of get a get a permission to merge it. Um, I, I don't think it's perfect, um, uh, and I think it will need another go around, but I think getting it into a draft for more wide review and um, also getting the all the CDDL fixed, uh, it's kind of key to getting the CDDL fixed is a really useful thing. So um, I want to point out a few things here. Uh, claims are not inherited. There's no inheritance. Um, between a, a, a module and a submodule. So like in this example, I'm showing here with submods, um, the nonce is repeated for each submod and um, like debug state would be have to be repeated for each um, submod. So the, the, the no inheritance um, character, characteristic kind of is, uh, you know, 
kind of in the keep it simple uh, category. Um, maybe it will result in uh, some larger uh, tokens. Um, I don't know, it sounds like that may be a concern, but um, is if we don't, if we do inheritance, then we have to start coming up with inheritance rules and they seemed scary to me to try to come up with inheritance rules, especially like through some of these claims are complicated and hard enough to understand as they are. So that's one aspect of it. Um, the other is this, uh, um, yeah, so this new uh, thing called attachment, a uh, submod attachment. It describes how a submodule is attached to the attester. So the values uh, can be, uh, it's enumerated, so unspecified, unspecified. Uh, device internal means it's in the same device enclosure. PCB internal means it's on the same circuit board. Chip internal means it's on the same uh, on the same chip. Is so, that mandatory? Uh, Specify. I mean, I guess so. I didn't really think think that through, but uh, you could uh, if it, okay. you would say unspecified if it's if you uh, don't know or. Well, I just say yeah, if it's optional, then unspecified is never going to be used. <laughs> right. You know, uh, Either say it's mandatory and delete the unspecified value, or say that it is, sorry, the other way around. Either say it's mandatory and unspecified as a value, or say that it's optional and there's no such thing as unspecified. Okay. It's just absent. Yeah, I would second the last option, and I wouldn't make uh, a suddenly a claim mandatory out of due, due to this here. This is not a reason to make something mandatory. So, I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <clears throat> the and this presumes that there is a fixed set of possible ways to attach. <coughs> yeah, I don't know if that's going to be reality. It's this is a difficult balance. Uh, I, uh, how, how do you deal with evolution of of hardware design is sort of make it reasonable to say something? So what if something is a uh, plugged in via USB cable? What does that make it? Yeah, exactly. Or it's a chiplet design, not really internal. It's a what kind of design? A chiplet. What's a chiplet? Exactly. <laughs> well, 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 please. I mean, I'm, it's, uh, I'm asking actually. It's a, it's, it's, it's a sort of new concept where you you chop up the wafer into multiple pieces and you um, mix and match them to to, to come up with with something that is uh, a lot uh, effectively a much larger <clears throat> uh, wafer. But it's, it's just made up of a bunch of small wafers lumped together. Okay, so the well, point is, it's it's uh, the technology is not fixed; it can change, and this is assuming it's fixed. How, how would a chiplet differ in its connectivity to a chip, and, and and does it need to be described? Because I guess the point is, going forward, we could have ten different variations like that, and do they? Is it important? I see that the USB cable is much much different than it's in the same chip in terms of. You know, what really, what right. really matters is is how flexible the configuration is, and I think that the point of having a an attachment claim is to try and speak to the um, configurability um, of the of the part. In other words, can it change? But it's not really called out directly as that. That's what we're trying to say here. And I, the threat is that if it's changeable, then it could change, and we want to be able to recognize that it's a changeable thing or not a changeable thing. Yeah. So because if it's not changeable, then you don't have to go and the, the freshness is less important. But you know, if it's a Formula One car and you change the tires every hour, then that's a different story. Right. So if, rather than try to to enumerate 
you know, different hardware designs, it might make more sense to talk more to the semantic of what you're after that's relevant to tr trustworthiness. Is it is it mutable, changeable, whatever whatever is the right term? So I, I wasn't going after mutable here at all. Yeah. I was going after uh, some some sort of rough notion of how easy it is to attack. So that if you have uh, an attester uh, reporting on a target that's you know a little bit removed from the target, how reliable is that attestation about that target? because this sort of goes to how easy it is for that somebody to trick that attester. Um, but that's, this doesn't really do that. I mean, let's say you have a USB cable attached uh, sub-module, but it's all inside of a great big locked cage uh, in, with, you know, a, a foot of lead or something like that. It's still external to the device, but it's very difficult to, to physically access, as opposed to something that uh, has an enclosure that is not locked down and is in a public location, device internal might be even easier to attack than the device external. Right. I understand how difficult this, this is, and this is so this is an attempt. Um, it seems we need to figure out what we're going to do here, um, because you do need to understand, I mean, the, the, the evaluator of the token needs to understand uh, how, uh, how well attached that target is to the attester. So I, I, on your intent, Lawrence, I guess the question is, do you have anything that's a claim, not about the sub-module, but about the attester itself? So let's assume that there's no sub-modules. How do you know if the device itself is attackable? Do you have anything that measures that? No, that, and, that, and that one it's, you can't really do anyways, because that would be, Self-claiming. The only way you do you deal with that would be through um, some sort of reputational thing or a certification program, and you would have to ask some sort of a third party, at nowhere near the target, the, the attester. Like, how good is this attester? Yep. Well, I, the reason I've asked is I I, I I was trying to figure out whether whatever the answer is, if the same answer would also apply to submodule. Around. <clears throat> if it's a signed submodule, then there's a if, it, if the submodule is an attester, then presumably there is a manufacturer's certificate about the attester, which is like the root of trust or whatever, that would describe what it is and how it's manufactured. And that, that's the same mechanism that we would describe in terms but of the easy, lead attester. But the point is, how easy to an is it to an attack is something that the manufacturer doesn't know. The how easy is it to attack has to do with where and how it's deployed and what the physical protections around it are. Right. So the ver the verifier has to make these kinds of decisions. It's the the manufacturer can say what it is. You know, this is how it was manufactured. But the verifier has to decide if that's attackable or not. And by creating a claim that's trying to capture those semantics, it's moving it's moving away from the verifier dealing with it to the implementer trying to specify it, but they don't know. And this is like, is it not delving into the endorsement domain? Because this starts to sound like the like endorsement of subcomponents. Uh, it seems like it, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, how would that endorsement of subcomponents work? How, how are you thinking? The, the manufacturer says, this is how I built the thing. I don't know if it's attackable or not, but that's up to the verifier to decide. But here's how it's built. So how does the, how, and, and how does the manufacturer describe that? He's going to describe it as, as uh, it's a, it's this, it's this, I'm this vendor and it's got this uh, model, uh, you know, it's this model and version of something. And I mean, he's going to write an essay of like, you know, in this in this router, the 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 the, the, the parts are plugable in yes, this way, and, and I use you know. He's going to write. He's going to write a policy that says I, for whatever reason, I trust or I don't trust this model of something. And so it's, yeah, it's a little bit like yeah, he's going to write an essay, but it's his policy, and how he arrives at the policy is. His business, the verifier. So 
So based on that, you would just be removing this, this whole submod attachment claim. Yeah. And I mean, submod attachment is going to be. You change what the goal is, right? It's like in terms of rather than it trying to just find some, how attackable something is, you try to focus on something that's a, a, a little less abstract. Like what? I I would say it would try to try to focus on how en enumerate how how um, modifiable it is or how flexible it is to to, to to how pluggable or not pluggable it is or how probable or something like that. I don't know. <clears throat> it, it, you know, if, if it isn't sort of straightforward and obvious, then maybe we don't need it for now. Add it later. Okay. Um, so let's put that one aside for a minute and I'll show you the, the way I, I set up the sub mods here. So the, the, Submods is sort of it's it, it kind of appears as a claim in the in the token. I mean, it's there's one um, label for the a map that contains all the submods. Um, so I'm just saying like 20 here is the label for the, the for all the submods. Um, so I'm showing three submods here. Um, the name, there's a name for each submod, and that is uh, the label in in the map. And, and each submod itself is a map that is basically uh, contains sets of claims. Um, if a if you're embedding a uh, an eat token inside another eat token, then instead of having a a map here. Um, you have the e token, and you can tell uh, by looking at the seaboard type, the seaboard tag, because this this tag this will be tagged to say it is a um, the, either a CWT or an e. However, we end up with that tagging, so you'll be able to tell by the type whether you're dealing with a you know a nested e or a, a submod, an unsigned unsigned submod. So that, that's the way the proposal is currently written. Is, um, in terms of terminology, is submod always an unsigned thing? Is it uh, always a signed thing and a submod always an unsigned thing? No, no. A submod is either signed or unsigned. But it, but it, a signed submod. Hey guys, is I, I just want to do a time check. We're at the top of the hour, so yeah. we can wrap up. Okay. Um, so it sounds like we don't have enough consensus to merge the um, uh, the submods uh, thing, which is what I heard is that you had consensus on everything except for the connection or whatever the last one was called. And if you were removed that, you could merge the rest and leave the uh, other one still open. Okay. If you're okay with that. All right. So I'm going to go for that, and I'm going to do some cleanup on the CDDL at the same time. Okay. Yeah, so if you move the other one into a separate PR so we can continue discussing this attachment type and merge all the rest. I'll do that, yes. Okay. Um, the other two th topics were um, some more debug stuff and the um, sort of guidelines for claim creation, um, but uh, we'll catch up with those the next time. And uh, so I'll, I'll be producing a draft with the submods and the UEID merge, the submods less the attachment type with those merged and, and that'll probably be the draft that goes uh, uh, gets, goes for um, IETF 107 in March. Okay, that sounds good. I mean, okay. I still encourage you to, to start the discussion over email. Um, oh, sure. Lawrence, the other ones, yeah. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try to push it into GitHub uh, issues, but um, yeah. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Okay, bye. <clears throat> bye. 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 Bye.